Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, June 9th, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, John Huntington, author of Far Right Vanguard, The Radical Roots of Modern Conservatism. Meanwhile, the House has passed a gun control bill banning sales of semi-automatic weapons for those under 21 and banning large capacity mag magazines, but the bill is DOA in the Senate. In a ruling yesterday, the Supreme Court ruled to protect many law enforcement officers who work for the federal government from civil rights lawsuits. You heard that right. That means Customs and Border uh, Patrol agents who abuse migrants or anybody, you're good to go. Donald Trump and two of his kids are penciled in to be questioned under oath by the New York AG in July. Two Omicron subvariants, BA4 and BA5, have been spreading in the U.S. and will likely be dominant by the fall, experts say. Trader Joe's workers in Western Massachusetts have filed seeking an election to become the company's first unionized store. The ACLU has filed a lawsuit on behalf of three families of trans kids and an LGBTQ organization challenging Texas Governor Greg Abbott's directive to investigate parents seeking gender-affirming care for their kids. There are nine families of trans kids currently under investigation in Texas. It's just... And lastly, police have arrested a man allegedly traveling to Brett Kavanaugh's home to kill him. We should probably retrofit his house so there is only one point of entry. I stole that from Matt, who stole that from Twitter. Yep. All this and more on today's program. Welcome to the show, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Hope everybody is having a lovely Thursday. Um, before we get into some of the heartbreaking testimony from the children and the parents in Uvalde, I want to highlight this Supreme Court ruling because, I, as I mentioned in headlines, I mean, it's just, this is like soft fascism, and maybe I'm being generous by saying soft. Um, it allows for a specific large subset of federal agents essentially really more targeted towards customs and border protect, protro, uh, protection agents to uh, act with impunity. Stern, uh, Mark Joseph Stern wrote this up in Slate. On Wednesday, the Supreme Court abolished individuals' ability to sue customs and border protection agents who violate their constitutional rights. In the process, the conservative supermajority came close to smothering lawsuits against all federal officers who defied the Constitution, granting them near impenetrable immunity. So, I mean, there are tens of thousands of Customs and Border Patrol agents, and already migrants, people crossing the border trying to seek asylum. I mean, you've seen the images. They already face insane abuse. But now the Supreme Court is ruling you're not going to have recourse because this is in the interest of national security, essentially. Wednesday's case, Egbert v. Bully, Bull, is the latest and most thorough attack on accountability for federal agents who break the law. The decision arises from a loophole in the federal statute that lets individuals sue law enforcement for damages. 
This statute authorizes suits against state law enforcement officers who infringe on civil rights, sheriffs, local cops, highway patrol, all can be sued in federal court for constitutional violations. But the statute does not authorize such suits against law enforcement officers who work for the federal government. The Supreme Court addressed this problem in 1971's Bivens v. Six Unknown Named Agents of Federal Bureaus of Narcotics, which involved a claim of excessive force against federal agents. And conservatives have been uh, essentially trying to go after this ruling for a long time. The court has insisted that the precedent applies only when the facts of the case are nearly identical to Bevin's. So in theory, when federal agents use excessive force, they still can be sued. But if that force takes place in some, quote, new context with, quote, special factors, a.k.a. if it's not essentially identical to the precedent, say, some connection to national security, as I mentioned earlier, the suit will fail. And because there is invariably some distinction between two cases, naturally, courts usually had an excuse to toss out Bivens' claims. And so Clarence Thomas basically wrote this up in the Supreme Court and moved the goalposts. He replaced the standard stern rights with an even more stringent one. Judges hearing Bivens' claims, he wrote for the court, should simply, should now simply ask whether there is any reason to think that Congress might be better equipped to cause uh, to create a damages remedy. Basically, though, what it comes down to, in this case that was brought, a federal agent allegedly used excessive force against an American citizen on American soil, the precise scenario to which Bevins ostensibly applies. So it did meet that initial criteria that this is the same thing as the precedent, so you should, in theory, if you were acting in good faith as a Supreme Court justice, which we know they're not, th this should be identical. But no, Thomas wrote, because the incident occurred so close to Canada, it was on the Canadian border, it has, quote, implications for national security and border security. As a result, greenlighting Boulay's lawsuit would constitute a, quote, judicial intrusion into Congress's policymaking role. So that's wh where this opens up this massive can of worms, worms. So tens of thousands of Border Patrol agents since it was involving the Canadian border in this instance, are going to have the ability to act with even more impunity than they do. <laughs> we saw images of them using reins as whips, essentially. Hey, if that happens to you, you probably don't have any legal recourse based on the Supreme Court. Um, this is within a 100-mile border exclusion zone, and if you don't know if you're within that uh, border zone, you might want to look at this map here, which is like, if you're near any sort of water or coastline, um, so, you know, the entire coasts, <laughs> uh, all major cities on the coasts, um, are all within this, even like the Great Lakes area, which I didn't know that this, it seems bizarre that like, Chicago is considered on the border, <laughs> um, but it's on the border, I guess. Yeah. So, just uh, another, tr it's, yeah, go on. Just to say one more thing, it's like, this is you could say well, fascism. This is making border agents an American Gestapo, and it means that if they need find a reason to go into your house for whatever reason that they want, um, that they'll have a legal precedent that they could cite saying, "Actually, we're just doing this because of national security." Exactly. With that said, let's turn to the congressional hearings on Uvalde. This is a clip of Maya Cirillo. She is a survivor of the Uvalde massacre, and she testified to the House Oversight Committee on what happened on that awful day. She thankfully survived, but her friends, her teacher did not. And she described what happened to her uh, via video call to the House Oversight Committee. And then she got an email and then she went to them and then she went to go lock the door and he was in the hallway and they made eye contact and then she went to back in the room and she told us go hide and then we went to go hide behind my teacher's desk and behind the backpacks and then he shot the little window and then he went to the other classroom and then he went, there's a door between our classrooms 
and he went to there and shot my teacher and told my teacher goodnight and shot her in the head. And then he shot some of my classmates and the whiteboard. When I went to the backpacks, uh, he shot my friend that was next to me. And I thought he was gonna come back to the room. So I grabbed the blood and I put it all over me. And what did you do then when you put the blood on yourself? Just stay quiet and then I got my teacher's phone and called 911. What did you tell 911? I told her that we need help and she said the police in, the, in our classroom. If there was something that you want people to know about that day and about you, right? Or things that you want different, what would it be? To have security. Do you feel safe at school? Why not? Because I don't want it to happen again. And you think it's going to happen again? So, um, she... She's right. She's right. She describes, if you didn't hear that, smearing blood on her to pretend she was dead. That You might have read that in some of the news reports. Using her teacher's phone to dial 911. She'll be traumatized for life. I mean, I, I'm just... It, it, thank God she's alive, right? But she's going to have to deal with this for, <laughs> for her life, as are the families, the parents of the victims. It's not just... The 19 who died, or was it 19? And, and I, I forget the exact number, at least 19. It's going to be their families who deal with these ramifications. And last night, Biden was on Jimmy Kimmel Live. And Jimmy Kimmel asked him about what he can do, essentially. And Biden said, quote, on gun control executive orders, that he doesn't want to, quote, Emulate Trump's abuse of the Constitution. Insulted. It's... Being an institutionalist is not, like, an actual mo moral compass. Believing in... It's the opposite. It's act in fr yeah, frankly, it's the opposite. But it is a... It, it ascribes a artificial moral justification for you to do nothing... In the wake of these massacres, and it's not just Uvalde, Buffalo happened, and shootings happened after that as well. It's cowardice that you ascribe some sort of, like, highfalutin justification in order to sleep at night. But, uh, you know, Obama was saying the same stuff I remember in the wake of Sandy Hook about what cannot be done via executive order because of the Constitution. Maybe, you know, he ha had some sort of futuristic vision and he was able to see that he didn't want to, in the past, emulate Trump via executive order, right? That makes sense. It's just, I mean, come on. FDR was uh, un unyielding in his use of his executive authority to make people's lives better. That's your responsibility as a leader, not to put institutions first and norms, which is like not really what he's doing. He's just hiding from it. The Constitution is a slave driver's document and it shouldn't be respected. Like, I mean, I understand that politicians have to operate within this, but like you can't you can't over dead kids say that you, you're going to be, uh, uh, you know, being paying uh you know, fealty to the Constitution. It's ridiculous. Well, also, I think you're right in the sense that I, as <clears throat> this is probably not his intention, but at the end of the day, does the intention really matter when he's basically saying um, the mores on Capitol Hill matter more than dead kids? Yeah. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the same, it's the same end result, regardless of whether he means it or not. Exactly. That is what you're supposed to do as a politician. You're supposed to make people's lives better. And it, like, in, you know, it, frankly, I, I don't really, I, I don't have, having affection for and fealty to documents and institutions and norms is giving way too much credibility to, yes, 
slave drivers, as, as Matt said, to racists, to a document that was created by wealthy white landowners and skewed towards their perspective. We live in this current reality. And frankly, I don't even think the Constitution says anything about this, but we live in a current context. And your job on this tiny, tiny time you have on Earth, Joe Biden, and this tiny, tiny time that you're in power is to do everything you can to make people's lives better and not to, to, to shrink in cowardice and pretend it's, it's um, in some sort of institutional norm situation. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we will be joined by John Huntington. We are back and we are joined now by John Huntington, author of Far Right Vanguard, The Radical Roots of Modern Conservatism. Uh, John, thanks so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Of course. Um, so your book focuses on the far right in its origins and in the United States. And it what what struck me as interesting and refreshing, frankly, is that you did not start your book in you know uh the nixon era or the reagan era where i feel like a lot of modern retrospectives about the conservative movement they often fall in that it, it, it fall into that and it's i i think it mi misses the broader scope of the fundamental f extremist foundations of the conservative movement that we're still frankly living with to this day mm -hmm. Was that a deliberate choice on your part to, to because you saw that there was maybe a gap in some academia on on some of that? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for the kind words. A, a gap in academia is exa exactly how I would phrase it. So I, I do think that there was kind of this this tendency amongst academics, and um, there are people who have written on this since the Trump years about how academics sort of focused on. People like William Buckley, Ronald Reagan, the the polite faces on the conservative movement who kind of brought conservatism to the broader population. And in doing so, when they focus on those people, they lose a little bit of the anger and the resentment uh, and the racism that helped push conservatism into the political mainstream to begin with. And so I tried to kind of reverse the order focus on the the groundswell happening on the bottom of radicals, conspiracy theorists, you know, white supremacists, and how they were the ones doing the organizing and the, you know, the signature drives, and they were the ones knocking on doors. And as, you know, I call them the vanguard of the movement very purposefully uh, for that reason. Well, I, I want to send your book uh, to Joe Biden and uh, <laughs> have him and Nancy Pelosi and the rest of Democratic leadership because... All we hear is that the Republican Party is not Trump. They're not Trump. There are respectable Republicans out there. And I mean, your book, it, it, it just illustrates how that's preposterous. There always were these elements in the Republican Party, even going back to the, the outset of the 20th century. Absolutely. And conservatism you know, as a political ideology spanned both parties for many years, right? Southern Democrats and the segregationist wing of that party. And so when... People like, I guess, Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi talk about working with the other side in our very polarized era. They're talking about a, a, a form of politics that just doesn't exist anymore. It, back in the day, you could have liberals and conservatives being both in, in both parties, but that just isn't the way things are today. And so things are the gridlock is much more apparent in our modern era. So let's let's start, uh, I guess, at the the 
out of the 20th century, the beginning there. Um, you know, the the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, I think, has is a essential uh, essential part or place to start, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but also the opposition to the New Deal as well. Um, talk about the wh- where you started your book um, and some of the you know the confluence of different factions within the conservative movement uh, in opposition to the the new deal as i say and also you know the rise of far right white militia groups like like uh the, sure. the renewed ku klux klan absolutely the the early 20th century is very very important for the rise of conservatism especially the 1920s i think were a really important moment because you have this renewed fundamentalist vigor you know fighting against uh, fun, uh e- evolution being taught in public schools. You've got the rise of the second clan and the nativism and racism that that brought to the forefront. And that version of the clan had some one to three million members, including men of society, politicians. It was not, you know, just a bunch of ex-Confederates in the backwoods. I mean, this was a real legitimate movement. And then when you build into the 1930s, when Franklin Roosevelt becomes president and starts instituting the New Deal, empowering labor, you know, uh, creating larger government programs, it kind of consolidates a large amount of the conservative, I guess, opposition to the New Deal. You have businessmen who don't want empowered unions. You have Southern segregationists who don't like the fact that, um, you know, uh, black and brown people are getting government benefits or are getting government jobs. And that might, you know, prevent them from being exploited in other in ways that they had historically. You have, you know, conspiracy theorists who believe that Franklin Roosevelt is going to bring, uh, you know, communism to America. And there's there was also legitimate fascist movements happening in the 1930s, the, the, the German-American boon, the silver shirts. And so all of this together is this broader kind of conservative ecosystem that was trying to fight against New Deal liberalism and the advent of or the, the implementation of social democracy in America. Were they uh, as coordinated as they became later in history or was this really kind of different factions you know which again you can totally extrapolate onto modern day anti-communism the racist um and the anti-labor uh part of of conservative or i guess you can put the anti-communist anti-labor together but um the the it based on fdr's success and popularity and again that was the um yeah, that had to do all, obviously with factors, you know, uh, the dep- depression as well. But um, mm-hmm. outside of uh, the, the conservatives' control, but were they not as organized as you would say as they became decades later? That's a really interesting question. And in terms of kind of the themes of conservatism, I will say the song very much remains the same. But I, I would definitely argue that they do become more consolidated later for a number of different reasons. In the 1930s, the conservative movement that I write about is a little bit more disconnected, right? You had guys like, uh, for example, there was a group called the Jeffersonian Democrats, and their whole goal was what they would view it as redeeming their Democratic Party. They didn't like Roosevelt. They felt like he had perverted their party. And so their main goal was just to get him off the ticket and, and get a real conservative on there. But Roosevelt was so popular that they did, they struggled to do this. So instead, they pivoted to actually supporting the Republican, who himself was kind of like a moderate to even liberal sometimes guy named um, Alfred Landon. And so as a result, their their politics was very much centered on getting rid of Roosevelt. Later on, the conservative movement will coalesce in a way that they will eventually take over the Republican Party, right? And and that's where figures like Barry Goldwater and even William Buckley, uh, you know, become important because they are spearheading a a broader conservative coalition than the ones in the 30s and 40s. So can we talk a a bit more about the second coming of the Ku Klux Klan um, and how that fit into particularly, you know, what was it, 1915 when, when they were founded once again? into um that that time birth of a nation comes out Mm -hmm. um you know there we were chatting about this before the show and um matt our producer was saying that the some people call uh the clan the the first real u.s fascist organization um in in the united states is that a fair assessment and um perhaps uh that you know you can 
draw comparisons to the present as well. So the, you know, I am not necessarily a scholar of fascism, but I do think that there are notes of fascism, certainly within the Ku Klux Klan, the authoritarian inclinations, the, the, the calls to uh, replenish America somehow, the, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but make America great again is very much a, you know, we need to renew, we need a renaissance in this country. And, and that's what the Klan was offering. And, and they very much, you know, clung both to the flag and to the cross at the same time, using Christianity and patriotism as a way to otherize certain people, whether it was immigrants or black Americans or whomever, uh, to create, you know, a more, a whiter nation, or at least a nation in which white people had all the power. And, you know, so I, I do think that there is a there is an element of fascism in that, I, you know, a lot of those notes are very similar. And part of the problem with the, the fascism conversation, which I'm sure if, if you guys on Twitter are, you know, know very well, it's been debated very much by academics. Part of the problem is that, you know, many people will only say, well, if it wasn't Nazi Germany or Mussolini's Italy, then it can't be fascism. But I think that misses the point of political culture, right, a culture of violence, a culture that that says that you know we need to bring America back to when it was great, usually which means a, a wider, more restrictive, less democratic America. Um, you know, these very much are the same sort of appeals that previous fascists have made, and I do think that there is a uh, that connection is warranted. And in conjunction with, say, the uh, first Red Scare uh, movement in around the same period in response to the Russian Revolution, can you explain what that uh, looked like in America around 100 years ago um, and, and how that was fundamental to conservatism at, at that time? Absolutely. It's the, you know, the Russian Revolution happens in 1917, kicking out, you know, the the czar and really overthrowing the the government that to the provisional government that took over after the czar after the the february revolution and for americans particularly of the conservative variety they viewed that as you know this left-wing movement that was being led by you know the bolsheviks as as overthrowing a an order that had existed for generations and so to them communism in its international kind of revolutionary character became an explicit threat and but communism also became a very useful strategic tool for conservatives. You could just paint any of your opponents as a communist, even if it's not true, and kind of that that those accusations had purchased back then. You had a lot of labor strikes going on in that era and in previous eras that sometimes turned violent. And people would say, okay, well, those guys are just communists. And it was a way to turn people against progressive movements. And so anti-communism not only became a, a widely held belief, but also a strategic tool for conservatives to demonize opponents that they didn't like or that they felt were, you know, taking America in the wrong direction. How did this, uh, and I, I want to, you know, we can move a little bit later in history, but I'm fascinated by this time period. How did uh, women's suffrage play into these dynamics as well? Now, that's an interesting question. And certainly for the Klan, the Klan used white women as a um, as something to be defended. The Klan often would would use white women as a as a symbol, this purity of America, and thus you know women in this case were reduced to a uh, you know to an object, something that something delicate and pure that needed to be defended by brave white men. Um, particularly, in, and often the Klan, of course, would use all sorts of vulgar language, insinuating that you know black men were trying to take advantage of, of white women. Um, and, and, and so women, for those types of people, um, it was essential to their politics. Nancy McLean wrote a great book on this called uh, Behind the Mask of Chivalry, talking about how the, how the chivalry of the Klan, um, they say they're defending white women, but in a way it also kind of masked their, their violence and their, uh, the anger that I think undergirded their movement. Yes, um, that, that, that's... Uh... That makes a ton of sense. Uh, I, you mentioned uh, briefly the Jeffersonian Democrats. Could you talk a little bit more about both James Reed, um, the the uh, I think you founded the Jeffersonian Democrats, mm -hmm. if, if I'm not mistaken, um, and there how he led an opposition to FDR using a lot of those prongs that we've previously discussed of, of mm -hmm. racism, anti-communism as well, 
as a, you know, a, the Repu- uh, not the Republican, but the conservative opposition to FDR. Mm-hmm. Yeah, James Reed is one of those kind of forgotten characters in American political history. He was a, a Missouri senator, and his big claim to fame as, the, as Missouri senator was torpedoing the League of Nations under Woodrow Wilson. Wilson, of course, wanted to form this big international alliance after World War I, and uh, using a lot of racist demagoguery, Reed helped torpedo it, despite the fact that Reed was from Wilson's party, showing that there were conservatives and progressives within the Democratic Party. And then after his Senate years, Reed kind of goes back to Missouri and, and starts practicing in a, in, a, in a private law firm. But then when FDR comes to power, he feels compelled, like he has to, uh, you know, to save the Democratic Party from itself, that they are going down the wrong path. And so in his mind, the the key figure that he pulls a lot of his ideas from is Thomas Jefferson. You know, Thomas Jefferson, of course, uh, the writer of the Declaration of Independence, but also a slaveholder and also not exactly a person who wanted everybody to be able to vote, despite the language of all men are created equal. And so when Reed and other Jeffersonian Democrats are talking about kind of redeeming the Democratic Party, what they're talking about is going back in time. This is a reactionary movement, right? A movement saying we've gone too far here and we need to turn back the clock to this previous era, an era that had less democracy, an era where more people knew their place in society. And Reed's movement, the Jefferson and Democrats spread um, into basically every state in the nation. Texas had a very prominent chapter. Uh, the guy that ran it was a guy named Jay Evans Haley, who is going to be a figure in uh, kind of a fringe figure, but a figure nonetheless in conservative politics all the way up through the Reagan era. In fact, uh, uh, an interesting note is that Reg, uh, that Haley, was a, who was a Texas cattleman, uh, he it, he got involved with the Jeffersonian Democrats, wrote a book against Lyndon Johnson in 1964, and then served as a delegate for Ronald Reagan. So literally just like that trajectory of going from radical to mainstream over the course of his lifetime. Uh, that's poetic, uh, right? You could tra- almost trace that uh, and, and trace your book along with it. Um, how successful were they in... Uh, did they get any gains in opposition to FDR and beyond the Jeffersonian Democrats? Not really. The, I often joke that my book is a book of losers. Uh, it's a book about losers because many of their elections, they just don't win. You know, these guys put together third party candidates. So, for example, in 1944, there was a group called the Texas Regulars that wanted to get FDR off the ticket. They failed. There was the Dixiecrat Revolt in 1948. They succeeded in some states, but failed largely to get their message out. You know, uh, George Wallace, 1968, loses. And so these guys are all losing. But the important thing is not necessarily the losses, but the fact that at each step of the way, the the web is tightening, right? Or the web is growing and the connections are tightening. You know, they're, they're getting to know each other. They're forming organizations. They're getting involved in each other's organizations. And so there's a lot of cross pollination and much of it revolves around the activism that they create during these moments, right? In 1956, for example, there was a a candidate named T. Coleman Andrews, who hilariously was actually working in Eisenhower's administration as the IRS's main guy, then quits. And then after he goes, he leaves government, he turns into an anti-tax advocate and runs in 1956 under a third party banner. He only gets like 100,000 votes. But the important thing is that at his... It, it, all of the the party, the third party activism that was going on brings a lot of these guys together. They have conferences in Chicago and they're all meeting and, and speaking and getting to know one another. And that, that's where the real important stuff is happening. So as these uh, these connections begin to uh, to form the web of modern conservatism um, is is uh, forming as well. Um you know, this you can also see how these webs of connections give birth to organizations eventually like the John Birch Society and other uh, conservative infrastructure that still to this day, uh, you know, they have uh, they can flex their muscle quite effectively. And would you argue that during maybe the 40s and 50s, that is an essential time period for the formation and consolidation of that kind of organized conservative activism? Absolutely. I think the 50s are, are a critical era. I think in my book, I think the title of that chapter is called The Cauldron, because it's this moment where anti-communism now has purchased across all of American society. Even presidents like Truman and Eisenhower are bent on, uh, could declare themselves anti-communists. Truman implements uh, loyalty programs. 
And so as a result, this emboldens and it legitimizes a lot of the things that the far right have been saying. You know, they've been saying that the government's been full of communists for 20 years at this point. And now they can say, see, we told you mm. not to mention, you know, Joseph McCarthy uh, and all of his witch hunting and all this stuff. And so absolutely. And th what's interesting is that in the modern day, the Birch Society has gotten a lot of attention, um, rightfully so. There's, they still exist. And But what I think is interesting is that the Birch Society, to me, wasn't the beginning of the far-right movement or even the beginning of you know the modern conservative movement, but more so kind of a culmination of a moment, because the far-right had been building since the New Deal era. And then in 1958, when the Birch Society is created, it's this moment where Robert Welch, the founder, decides, well, the far-right has been so disconnected for so long, we need to have a central kind of clearinghouse organization. And that's what the Birch Society became. You know, was this big organization, uh, you know, boasting at least 100,000 members, maybe more. They never released their membership roles, so we don't really know how many people there were. Uh, but the important thing about the Birchers is that not only do they provide kind of a central meeting ground, like a point of convergence, but also they just do things. Right. You know, William Buckley isn't out there knocking on doors and getting people to sign signature drives. Right. He's writing op eds in National Review, whereas Birchers are going out there and knocking on doors, asking people to sign signature drives, registering voters. Those are the people who are who are spearheading this this conservative movement. And that's to me why the far right is so important in in, in their ground game and in the fact that, as you mentioned, at this point, it's just anti-communism is ubiquitous and that I, would you say that that's an indication of uh maybe a canary in the coal mine for early uh rhetorical wins by the conservatives because that's 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 a consensus by this time period absolutely and 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 i think you guys would probably agree that i, I would argue that conservatives for a long time have been better at messaging than, oh, than yes. liberals or leftists <laughs> or democrats or whomever you know they they're just so good at at, at winning those rhetorical battles and i think anti-communism was one of those moments. Now, in fairness, they did get kind of like a leg up because with the Soviet Union and the post-World War II era making communism kind of this, this focal point, uh, you know, the, it, it really legitimized and, and, and kind of fueled the far right's rhetoric. And it, you know, it, like I said, it, it just, it made them seem like they were telling the truth or at the very least that there was something there. And of course we haven't even really touched on it, but a lot of this anti-communism though does lead to conspiracy thinking. You know that there's this big bad enemy that's kind of pulling all the strings. Well, Robert John Welch, Birch was instrumental in mainstreaming that as well. Absolutely, Robert Welch. You know, wrote a book um, in the in, in, throughout the 1950s, and finally started he started sending it to people like William Buckley and others. And in his book, it's called The Politician. He basically accuses Eisenhower of being a communist, like the the D Day guy. You know what I mean? Like he's like, oh, Eisenhower's a communist, and it's just this ridiculous characterization. You know, but he stacks the facts just right to where if you squint at it, you're like, oh, maybe, you know. Right. And and you mentioned Buckley. That's probably important to start talking about his influence, right? Um, I, I, I did another interview maybe a year ago. God, all of this uh, blends in my mind, frankly. But uh, Buckley later kind of tried to distance himself from John Birch. But he was... Uh, a, I think talking out of both sides of his mouth to that degree, because it's another example of this desire, this impulse to say there's a distinction between the crazies mm -hmm. and the Mitt Romneys or whatever. Um, but frankly, they're, they're, it's a symbiotic relationship. And Buckley was very much involved uh, or at least, you know, kind of working alongside uh, the, the Birchers and the crazies. Um, what, what did you and your research find in terms of that relationship? Um, and is my characterization accurate, frankly? <laughs> no, I do think your characterization is accurate. And I think this is one of the key areas in which historians have um, not done a great job of telling the history of the conservative movement, because historians often focused on guys like Buckley. And of course, Buckley wanted to draw those lines of respectability and would say, oh, no, no, we're not like those guys. And historians picked up on that and then wrote these books about this respectable conservative movement and that there were these rigid definitions and that the you know the crazies and the kooks were over here and these guys are legitimate but the problem is is that that's not reality there was a lot of overlap and continues to be a lot of overlap the these you know the the conservative movement is a big tent and all the definite all the the boundaries that might exist all the words that we use to describe various types of conservatives those boundaries are very porous 
you know, just to give you an example, in the 1950s, when Robert Welch was writing his book, he corresponded with Berkeley. Uh, the guy who, Roger Milliken, one of the key funders of National Review, Buckley's magazine, um, Roger Milliken was a Birch Society member. You know, uh, Robert Welch donated $2,000 to National Review to help get it off the ground in the early 50s. You know, so the, it's, and, and in fact, the very views that Buckley had aren't all that dissimilar from the, you know, what the far right was saying. In, in, very in, uh, infamously, in 1957, Buckley wrote a book or wrote an article in National Review talking about uh, race in the South and argued that the white race was he called white people the advanced race. Those were his exact words and said that as a result, they have a right to rule. And so it's like, how is that any different from what Southern segregationists are saying? Right. It's the exact same thing. Well, it's it. That's a good opportunity to talk about since we are in this time period, so the civil rights era and how this plays into this Brown v. Board um, in the fifties. I'm forgetting exactly what year that was. Or no, no, fifty four. You're in fifty four. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Um, I'm terrible with dates, honestly. Uh, but but um, th this is happening right at the same time period. So I, the, there's the end. Just like it was decades before, there's the Klan and the anti-communism elements, um, mm -hmm. and there's the racism and the continued anti-communism elements. Um, how was this time period of conservatism? It, it seems obvious, but maybe it's not. You know, uh, developing itself in opposition to to black people and to civil rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's well, there's the, the, there's the various obvious opposition, right? The 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 people who just don't want segregation to end. And in 1954, you know, there's there's all sorts of pushback. Uh, there's the the Southern Manifesto that gets written, I believe, in 1956 by a bunch of congressmen who all sign it and basically say that, you know, the state is, you know, has its boot on our neck, more or less. And of course, then you see guys running for Congress or, or for president, even George Wallace. But what I find so interesting about this moment is that there's there are rhetorical shifts that start happening in the 50s and 60s, because at a certain point, you, in some states, you can still be an overt racist, but in a lot of states, you can't anymore. And so at a certain point, conservatives sort of dial back the racism and shift to what they would call like color, what or what some scholars would call like dog whistle politics or even like colorblind conservatism, this idea that they start talking about states' rights and other, other forms of uh, other things that if you kind of scratch at that surface, it's still the same old racism. It's still trying to keep Jim Crow around, but not with the blunt racism of the 30s and 40s, per se. And again, that's that's generalizing, but I, I do think that was happening. So uh, let's now move to uh, Richard Nixon's run in 1962, because... Uh, this probably does inform, you know, some of the ahistorical division between the Birchers, the crazies and the respectable Republicans, because he does he does try to draw that uh, that line himself, um, not particularly successfully or or make that division. Um, mm -hmm. What does his run uh, in, in 62 say to you about um, uh, uh, reflect on, on that on that time? Sure. So in 1962, of course, Richard Nixon running for a, a dog in 1962, <laughs> Richard Nixon is running for the California governorship and right. very much tries to draw a line between himself and and the Birchers. The Birchers were very, very powerful and large in California. Um, they had control of a, or at least very influential, and I believe it was called the California Republican Assembly, the CRA. And in, it, basically when he drew that line and said, I am not like those guys, and in fact, we need to distance ourselves from these radicals, they basically made it their life's mission to never let Nixon get elected. <laughs> And in 62, it works, right? Nixon loses in 1962. Uh, and, and that's where the famous, like, quote to the media, you know, you don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. And he, like, huffs off uh, from his press conference. But the, 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 the point is that Nixon realized something. He had essentially touched the third rail. And the third rail of the conservative movement is the far right. They're the ones who are driving the bus, even if he didn't realize it at the time. And so when he comes back in 1968 and runs for president again, he's much more conservative. He does not make those distinctions as as readily. Uh, he uses the phrase law and order. Again, that's a great example of that dog whistle politicking. It's not racism, 
but white people knew what he meant, mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah, absolutely. I think that Nixon learned that lesson in 1962 and then corrected it in 68. And Goldwater and learned, Goldwater kind of learned, and he was more successful in, in, uh, representing both, uh, both poles of the, of the Republican party. Yeah. And Goldwater was absolutely part of the far right. They, yeah. they viewed him as one of their own. And that's one of the things that I think is so fascinating about historians when they started writing a, a history books about conservatism in the 90s, Goldwater played a huge role as this kind of beginning moment. And to me, Goldwater is not even the beginning, but really the culmination. This was the, the far right believed that they had made it. In 1964, the Republican Party had its convention in San Francisco, and there were birchers on the ground floor. And when Nelson Rockefeller, the famous New York liberal, got up to speak to the to the Republican uh, you know uh, delegates and was trying to say that we need to move away from this extremism. He literally gets drowned out by booze and by chants of "We want Barry," and so the far right believed this was our moment. And then, of course, Goldwater gets absolutely obliterated in that election. Right. And so, for some people, they're like, "Okay, well, the far right is might maybe too much of a liability." But I think that's the wrong lesson. I think the actual lesson that they took from it is we can't be overtly extreme, but we still need those votes. And so they have to figure out a way to kind of thread that needle. And that's where I think the law and order rhetoric comes from and these sorts of things. They figure out that way to uh, to phrase their politics in such a way that appeals to both mainstream and the the far right. So is that a lesson they take from the shellacking that, that Johnson gives to to uh to Goldwater or, I mean, what were some of the lessons uh, learned there? So in the immediate, like in the immediate aftermath of Goldwater, I'm talking like the days afterwards, people all over the the newspapers in the country were basically declaring conservatism was dead, that, that this was, uh, you know, the end of conservatism that Goldwater had shown that this was a, you know, a cul-de-sac, right? A political a dead end. But, but William Buckley in one of his columns said that he thinks that the, uh, the grave diggers were premature he didn't think it was over. And the reason why is because the movement had been built to the point where it could sustain itself. It wasn't just that you could topple over one candidate and that that was the end of it. There was still a sustained conservative movement on the ground level being led in part by the far right um, and at the top level being you know, led by periodicals like National Review. And so to, to, to Buckley, the lesson was we need to kind of refine our rhetoric and we need to figure out a way to still get our politics across while maybe moderating our language. Well, and it ends up paying uh, dividends for them for them later. Um, it is interesting when, you know, talking about Goldwater, I can't help but think about like Hillary Clinton embracing your say, what did she call herself? A Goldwater, a Goldwater girl. Goldwater girls. Yeah. When, uh, when she was younger. Right. Yeah. Right, or, right. When she was younger and she worked, she worked for him, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Um, at the outset of her political uh, career, basically. And, you know, what maybe this is a bit, uh, you know, transition or transitioning to the present, but uh, it's amazing how they've how conservatives have been so successful at normalizing their extremism. And until very recently, particularly in the 90s and after getting like. 80% of what they wanted included uh, in democratic speak and embrace in the form of neoliberalism, frankly, but, um, and mm -hmm. also in welfare reform under Clinton, like they won so thoroughly the, the, this, the culmination of all of their work and organizing, frankly, paid dividends, not just in terms of like Reagan's landslides and, uh, the the tax cuts, but the embrace of a lot of the platform in the the opposition party. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I mean, and the Democrats, rather than they, they never quite returned to the liberalism of the mid twentieth century. They just they just figured, well, that's over. We can't do that anymore. That's not where the politics, the the you know the the general American public is, and so they've shifted to this you know the triangulation the uh, the neoliberal era that we still continue to live in. It, it, what's interesting, though, is, is that conservatives are never quite, and I think this is true for any political ideology, but conservatives are never satisfied with the person that they have in power. Reagan's a great example. Reagan cut taxes. Reagan crushed unions. 
Reagan stripped away regulation. So very much a an economic, you know, the, the libertarian economics, the the for the swaggering foreign policy, but the religious right felt betrayed by Reagan. They didn't think that he did enough for them. And it's fascinating because now the religious right very much feels like Trump is there, um, you know, that, that Trump will do what they want him to do. I mean, look at the Supreme Court, right? And so it's, you know, but, but yet uh, Trump is not, uh, th there are still conservatives who believe that Trump is not, um, not doing enough or didn't do enough in his presidency. Yeah, there, well, there's, a, there's an ideological discipline on the right uh, in terms of the way that the base can flex its muscle that is, is just absent currently on the left frankly i mean we're see it's getting better but um th th it's nowhere near the apparatus that has been as you write i mean it's it's been a hundred years in the making honestly when i think part of the problem is that the 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 conservative movement has so much more financial heft available you know they have b billionaires who will just funnel money into think tanks and periodicals and whereas the left doesn't necessarily have that at their disposal. And it's also hard, especially if you're from a left-wing mindset, to support a party that seems to punch left all the time. Yeah. And and so as a result, it always feels like the Democrats, the the kind of left-wing side of the political spectrum is so much more fractured. It also has a the harder time of trying to be a big tent. You know, nowadays the the Democratic coalition is a lot creakier because it's just a bigger tent in many ways, and there's a lot more factions within it. And so it's it's difficult, you know, what the Democrats are trying to do. But this goes back to the the rhetoric, and I and I agree with you that uh, the right is much much more disciplined because even back in the fifties and sixties, they would recognize that, you know, Nixon's not perfect, but he's better than that guy, and so they would vote for him and then use that as a as a stepping stool up to the next big victory. Um, and and the left just doesn't have that, and there's a lot of different reasons why, but that's just I think that is true. Well, I mean, I could rant about the Democratic Party uh, until I, I keeled over. But um, <clears throat> I mean, I I, I do want to just emphasize how your book just makes it so clear that the battles that we're seeing or not even the battles, but the the factions within the current conservative movement, it's really nothing new. Marjorie Taylor Greene versus Mitt Romney. I mean, that's that that is the same big tent that you describe. And so to bring it back to where we really started our conversation, um, it, it's super clear to me that this there they might be different shades within the same enemy. I mean, I perceive the right as an enemy, um, mm -hmm. but but they are one and the same. And so I, I think that's fundamental to understanding the enemy is not to say, oh, that we want to go back to the good old days when there mm -hmm. were respectable re Republicans um, like like Goldwater or like William F. Buckley, mm -hmm. who yeah. all were this. It's just the same thing. It's just we don't have the historical literacy to to understand that in this country, frankly. I, I think what Pelosi and others are fail, fail to realize is that the difference between the radical conservatives and the mainstream conservatives, it's a difference of degree, but not kind. Right. They're part of the same movement. But many times they're advocating for the same things, maybe just using different language. Exactly. All right. Well, uh, can't thank you enough. John uh, Huntington, you can check out his book, Far Right Vanguard, The Radical Roots of Modern Conservatism. Uh, John, thank you so much for, for your time today. I really appreciate the discussion. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Of course. All right, folks, with that, we are going to head into the fun half. To be taking your calls, reading your IMs, Binder and uh, and Branding will join us. But At Matt, some point, I think. Yes, but Matt, what what uh, happened on Left Reckoning last night? Yeah, we had uh, Kurt Hackbarth on uh, yesterday evening to uh, talk about AMLO not appearing. At the uh, summit of American states, uh, um, righteously, and the uh, retaliation. We we updated. Basically, Ilhan Omar signed a letter uh, saying that AMLO doesn't care about journalists dying. That was really, in my opinion, and the opinion of Kurt Hackbarth, our guest, uh, something that Congress put together to uh, discipline AMLO for not appearing at the 
uh, Joe Biden, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, uh, Summit of American Democracy, or whatever they're calling it. Um, and uh, and it was bad of Ilhan to do. So we talked about that um, last night. Patreon.com slash Left Reckoning. We also talk about uh, uh, trailer park uh, oligarchs who uh, own too many, and then alternative models of ownership there. And the Fed uh, coming to suppress wages. And also we had our first uh, summer stream where we the post game wasn't just for members. We uh, streamed it on Twitch last night and Ben Burgess uh, joined us uh, for that. So you can get that uh, for free, actually. The post game is free on Twitch right now. You can go watch the uh, replay. Uh, Whoa. So Twitch.tv says Left Reckoning Go. Subscribe if you uh, subscribe on Twitch. All right, we'll head into the fun half before they join us. Um, but definitely check out Doomed, check out Scam Economy, and check out The Discourse. Those are great shows from our friends, Brandon and Matt Binder. We'll be getting into it. Maybe we'll be talking a bit more about uh, that <laughs> drag show for kids controversy with, with Binder and more. We'll be taking your calls and reading your IMs, 646 257 uh, 39. Wait, I tried to do that by memory and then I second guess myself. 3920. Yep. See you in the fun half. <laughs> Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now. And I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now. But I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go, like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For hold on for a second. The Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun. Matt. You. Fun. What is up, everyone? Fun. No, me key. You did it. Fun. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Uh, seven, eight. Yes. Hi, right, me? This me? Yes. Uh, is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello? Is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? Oh, no sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, God. I'm going to go start right. Who libertarian? They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking did! So, what's 79 plus 21? Challenge men. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857 210 35 501 one half. 38 911, for instance. $3,400, $1,900, 654, three trillion dollars sold. It's a zero sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes to satire. <laughs> On top of it all? Yeah. My favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, yeah. like everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks, folks, folks. It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I, I don't know. But you should know. People just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Look, gotta jump. You gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. Two o'clock. We're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, Sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye.